Final Fantasy thrives on reinvention. Each subsequent mainline game chooses to keep certain aspects and throw out others. New battle systems, new settings, new story themes, new leveling systems, and new characters. If there's one thing that remains consistent throughout the series, though, it's the emphasis on character development. At the heart of every installment are people. I can't think of a game character from 1991 more complex than Cecil, the protagonist of Final Fantasy IV. The sixth game is filled to the brim with interconnected relationships as its sprawling roster grows over the course of a playthrough. And even those unfamiliar with RPGs know the cast of Final Fantasy VII, or at least Cloud from Smash Brothers or something. And that's not an accident. From the early days until now, the teams behind each Final Fantasy installment take care to make sure that the visuals on point, the music is beautiful, and the characters are memorable. But since the core mechanics of each game change so much, the relationship between gameplay and character change from entry to entry as well. In a game with a predetermined narrative, the game's mechanics can alter the way a player behaves to make them act more like the character. If done well, a player will treat a controllable avatar not as a mere pawn on a chessboard, but as an authored character with behaviors unique to them. Maybe this is why I personally keep coming back to Final Fantasy X. Much of the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay and overarching party progression supports characters. They're not treated as collections of stats, but as people in a story. People that, to me at least, make up one of the best ensemble casts in all of games. And in that ensemble, there's one character who, admittedly, is pretty easy to forget about. But he's the character who's supported by his mechanics more than anyone else. Final Fantasy X has seven main characters, each with their own predefined character class. Waka is a damage dealer, Lulu's a black mage, Yuna's a summoner, and so on. The player cannot change any character's broad strokes, but they do have agency over smaller decisions. Like most turn-based RPGs, characters gain experience points after every battle. Get enough experience, and they'll gain a level or two. In Final Fantasy X, the levels manifest as moves on this, the sphere grid. It functions like a cross between a skill tree and a board game. So if main character Titus is here on the sphere grid, he can activate the spheres next to him. In this case, he can activate defense plus two, a delay attack ability, and 20 magic points, if he has the right resources. Now, if he participates in battles and earns enough experience to gain a level, he can move to the next space, which will unlock evasion plus three. Gain another level and uh, nothing, but gain another level and the player is faced with a decision. Okay, so first off, we can activate Strength plus two. We can continue on the path ahead, or we can take a look at this level one lock next to us. If we have a level one key, we can open it up and go through. But is that something we want to do? Behind this lock is 200 health, accuracy plus two, and spirit plus two, which are all good boosts, but is it worth it to spend a key? Is it worth it to spend three more moves and then have to backtrack out? At this point, the player also has a third option to take a detour to the right. It'll take three hard-earned moves, but Titus can increase his magic ability by six. Is Titus becoming a magic user in your party? Or do you even foresee Titus becoming a magic user? Or is it better just to forge ahead on his main path? The player has three viable options at this juncture. Which one will you take? The six other characters have their own starting points and paths along the sphere grid. All of them will have the occasional side streets they can go down, or not. It's ultimately up to the player and what they deem important. Regardless, each character's path and gain stats reflect their role in battle, which in turn supports their role in the story. Titus is the most well-rounded of the bunch. He's not the strongest nor the fastest, but he's good to use in just about every battle situation. Since he fills the role of the point of view character, it would make sense that he doesn't fall into any specific character class too far. The more open-ended he is, the more the audience can project onto him. His character starts the story as a pro athlete, so his stats favor health, strength, agility, and accuracy good quality for someone who plays blitzball for a living. Compared to Waka though, the other pro athlete in the party, he's not nearly as strong, but Waka is not nearly as fast. This is supported by the numbers that change with every move on the sphere grid, but it's also made apparent by their character designs. Waka is built like a football player, and Titus is built, well, like a football player. Yuna is kind, selfless, so it would make sense that she has the most healing and support skills at her disposal. She's not physically strong herself, but she has powerful summons that do the fighting for her, much like she has a party of guardians that deal most of the damage. 
Oron is the most mysterious of the bunch, at least at first. He has fortified emotional walls up all around him, keeping secrets hidden behind metaphorical armor. His path along the sphere grid reflects this, with his high health and defense, along with his ability to pierce through armored enemies. Lulu is a black mage, so naturally she learns plenty of offensive magic over the course of the journey. Character-wise, she comes across as both aloof and strong-willed, so her path also contains plenty of evasion and health boosts. Riku takes up the thief slot in the party, so her learned abilities involve being quick, stealing resources from enemies, and being able to slot in in most battle situations. She, like Titus, is a well-rounded character, albeit with more of a support slant. Riku also has the unique ability to disassemble Machina enemies. She belongs to the pro-technology Albed race of people, so her track on the sphere grid sits opposite of Waka's, the anti-technology fundamentalist. Her path also sits between Yuna's and Lulu's, the two characters that she can truly call friends by the end of the story. Titus's path sits between love interest Yuna and mentor Auron. The eventual romantic couple Lulu and Waka's paths are next to each other as well. The paths themselves support the characters' relationships to one another. And then there's Kamari. Okay, officially Kamari is a blue mage, meaning that he has the ability to learn enemies' moves and use them for himself later. But beyond that, he doesn't have a unique role in the party when it comes to battles. While the other six characters have meandering paths on the perimeter of the sphere grid, Kamari is confined to this little section in the middle, at least at first. The available spheres in this section will create a balanced character. It has a good balance of strength, defense, and magic, but it's small. Outside of the gated-off Ultiba spell in the middle, Kamari's path is the easiest to complete. Before too long, the player will have to make a decision. Whose footsteps should he follow in? Kimari has access to four level 1 locks, each of which spill out onto another character's sphere grid path. He can go right to follow Waka, down to follow Lulu, up to follow Titus, or left to follow Riku. So would you rather have another damage dealer, another black mage, another balanced character with an offensive slant, or another balanced character with a defensive slant. It's up to the player, and there's no definitive answer. And full disclosure, Kimari can also follow Yuna, but the player will need to wait until they have a level 2 key. It's available, but it's not encouraged by the game. Also, Oren's path doesn't directly connect to Kimari's at all, which adds to Oren's outsider status. So, in effect, Kimari ends up becoming a lesser version of another character. As a collection of stats that fight other collections of stats, there isn't much that defines him. He has no apparent advantage in battle. There aren't any enemy types that only Kimari is strong against. Conversely, he isn't weak against anything either. He's redundant. On the sphere grid, he has no path of his own. Kimari belongs to the Ronso tribe. Well, at least he did before the events of the story. In the world of Final Fantasy X, the Ronso are strong warriors who live on the unforgiving Mount Gagazet. Compared to the other Ronso, Kimari is smaller than the rest of his peers. He has the spirit of a warrior, but does not possess the physical strength to rise in the ranks of his community. When a fellow Ronso broke the horn growing from his head, his spirit broke as well. Disgraced, he could no longer live on Mount Gagazet. He had to find a new path on his own. This backstory, while not revealed to the player immediately, is illustrated with his sphere grid path. He's a part of the party, that's how he ended up on the grid in the first place, but his specified role on the grid is undefined. What does a Ronso do when outside of Ronso culture? The game asks the player to answer that question. His first move on the sphere grid is a choice. The other character's starting points are linear, with only the occasional branch, but Kamari? His path is circular. It's confusing. This serves two purposes. The first is to introduce the concept of branching paths and decisions on the sphere grid. Kimari serves as a tutorial of sorts for game-wide decision making. He lets the player dip their toes in the Final Fantasy X's flavor of character customization while not overwhelming the player by making them immediately decide the fates of seven characters, just the one. The second purpose is to mirror his story, to have his RPG character progression mimic his narrative character growth. After getting ostracized from the Ronso tribe, Kimari had no place to go. His life could have gone in any direction until he met Yuna and became her protector. Kamari not only represents, but embodies the feeling of being lost, the feeling of not knowing which path forward is the right one. Who do we follow? What do we learn? What do we deem important? As the game marches on and the party members grow stronger, so too does their synergy. 
If following each character's path linearly, each one will run into their neighbors at some point. Titus will learn Yuna's healing skills. Yuna will gain offensive stats with Riku. Riku will become a better mage with Lulu. Lulu will gain more physical strength from Waka. Waka will become an even stronger tank with Oran, and Oran will become more agile and faster with Titus. The party becomes more unified. Each character has less of a defined role and more of a general strength and weakness. They work better as a team. They learn from one another. And Kimari is the character that introduces this concept. He has to learn from another party member. He proves to the player that characters can learn from each other. People who are way more patient than I am have gone through and had every character learn every skill from every other character. This is complete overkill, but it's significant that the game lets the player do this in the first place. The party can, in theory, learn everything from each other. This version of the maxed out party is, naturally, the strongest version of it. And I think that's just poetic. While Kimari might not have the largest role in the plot of Final Fantasy X, nor is he the most iconic or memorable character, he's still important. He could have just been a generic party member. After all, he has no clear progression of his own. But he's not. He's a character in a story. A character that can grow and change. He's a person. 